Welcome to Pure Nonfiction, the podcast interviewing documentary filmmakers. I'm Tom Powers, the documentary programmer for the Toronto International Film Festival and artistic director for the Doc NYC Festival. On this episode, I talk to Matt Turnauer, the director of Citizen Jane Battle for the City, about the author and activist Jane Jacobs. In 1961, she published The Death and Life of Great American Cities that changed the way we think about urban planning. Soon after the book was published, she learned that New York's power broker, Robert Moses, wanted to demolish her neighborhood in the West Village in order to build a highway through Lower Manhattan. The film documents her fight against Moses. I suddenly had to put into practice my own premises that if anything was going to happen to reverse the way things were being done, and the citizens had to take some initiative and the citizens had to frustrate the planners. I thereupon began to devote myself to frustrating planners. Matt Turnauer is a longtime writer for Vanity Fair. His first documentary was Valentino, The Last Emperor, about the Italian fashion designer at the end of his career. I sat down with Matt in late March in New York City. I want to ask about your background. You grew up in Los Angeles. Your father was in the TV business. Did, mm-hmm. did it feel like you were growing up in a show business world? Uh, yeah, a little bit. TV, until recently, was very second tier. It's only recently the TV's top tier. So my uh, father was the producer of Columbo and the writer also, uh, Columbo. He did the miss was called the NBC Mystery Wheel, which hmm. was uh, all these very kind of sort of long form mystery shows. Columbo was the best of them. Murder She Wrote was the Cash Cow. He uh-huh. also did that. Uh, so it was kind of like a low level Hollywood at that time. You really felt the burden of being a TV family in LA. <laughs> <laughs> you carried it like it was an albatross. <laughs> Was it at the high school, were there like the movie kids and then the TV kids? Most definitely. Most definitely. Yeah, we, I went to Crossroads School, which was, is now sort of famous, but then it was kind of like the, the hippie, enlightened hippie school. And the more liberal Hollywood people sent their kids there. And there were definitely, there was definitely a caste system. Uh, I'm, I mean, this is sort of tongue in cheek, but yeah, there were the movie families and they were real and the tv families were just like making a living so when it was time for you to figure out your career what direction did you head i ran screaming from la actually i love los angeles and never gave up my california driver's license actually and and i moved back two years ago but i went to school on the east coast and was a film major at Wesleyan University in the the least Hollywood town you could imagine, this like, not glamorous town in the middle of Connecticut, and uh, but it has a great film program, and uh, that's what I studied. I moved to New York after that, I think because looking back, I was the son of a TV writer, and it seemed to be the obvious thing to do, to go back to LA and start writing freelance screenplays, which is what I think literally every one of my friends did. Even if they <clears throat> even if they were school friends not from LA, everyone moved back. A lot of people moved into my parents' house actually and kind of squatted in my guest house and were writing their freelance scripts and I moved to New York and became a journalist, which was also very interesting to me. Matt got an entry level job at the satirical magazine Spy, then followed its editor Graydon Carter to the New York Observer and finally Vanity Fair. Graydon's a very enterprising person. He's an autodidact, so he gets, like, young talent. Hmm. And he just started giving me assignments at Vanity Fair. So I was writing there um, at, an, at an early age. And doing all my stories were kind of L.A. They were kind of weird Norma Desmond stories about Los Angeles, which I was always interested. I think this goes back to my upbringing there. Because the kind of famous people my parents knew were – these strange kind of character actor creatures that were the great survivors of L.A. Like they knew Lucille Ball's sidekick who wasn't Vivian Vance, (laughs) Um, that type of person, or Doris Roberts, uh, who became, you know, she was on Everyone Loves Raymond, but these like survivor character actors, Charlotte Ray before The Facts of Life, 
I knew all those people from growing up and they, that gave me a weird insight into the under, I don't want to say the underbelly because that sounds critical of that kind of actor, but there's another Hollywood that's not the A-list Hollywood. And I was not fascinated the, with Not the cover of Vanity Fair. Yeah. So I never, I rarely, rarely wrote, I've always, I wrote a few cover stories of Vanity Fair and always cringed all the way through them. Uh, but I liked the kind of secret. Hollywood, the secret history Hollywood. I call it the Norma Desmond Hollywood. So you have this good run as a uh, Vanity Fair writer, which for many people would be a comfortable place to stay. But then you decide to make a film. What was motivating you there? I'm a very visual person. So writing uh, was great. I wrote long form features. I still do on occasion. I really, I was a film major. I wanted to flex those muscles. Uh, and the kind of writing I did and the kind of place Vanity Fair is, it's, it's a siloed place. It's not collaborative. So you would write in your silo and then you'd give your story over. And then it's very visual magazine too, but you had no, there was no way to touch the visual. Uh, and I had this great desire to do that. And I wanted to make a documentary. It seemed like the type of writing that I did and do, which is sort of like the 10,000 word, if you're that lucky these days, because word lengths are shorter, but the long form kind of like down the rabbit hole story was basically like a documentary treatment. And my great influence actually as a journalist is Grey Gardens. Hmm. It's that let the characters tell the story themselves, which is direct cinema, cinema verite, and don't intervene intervene as little as possible. A lot of the Vanity Fair type of journalism, the first word of the article is I, or when I, mm -hmm. and uh, people would insert themselves in the story, or it becomes, there's a kind of like also version of it. Well, the Dominic Dunn is the, the kind of like the top of that genre, right? Where you become sort of like Miss Marple um, going through your story. Anyway, I love this sort of invisible style form of documentary or direct cinema or cinema verite. And I was always trying to do that in my story. So it seemed to me along the road, about five, seven years into this, I could do this in a movie, mm. which was my dream. I'd really wanted to do that. Matt's first film, Valentino, The Last Emperor, is about more than fashion. It's about one era giving way to another. The world today, the world of fashion today is very, very, very different. If there is a reason for Valentino to stop one day, that's the reason. That it is not a word made for, for him. The movie's about Valentino and his partner, Giancarlo Giamatti. They've been together as a couple in business and in life for more than 50 years now. I never pitched the movie to financiers that way. I always said it was going to be about glamour and fashion and movie stars, and then I got money. If I had said it was a movie about two guys, two gay guys in their 70s <laughs> and their lifelong relationship and business association, I never would have gotten a penny. But that's what I made the movie about. I think you have to – sometimes you have to tell um, – who said it, truthful hyperbole uh, yeah. <laughs> about, uh, about the movie you're making in order to get the money. The film debuted at the Venice and Toronto film festivals to standing ovations, but the distribution offers were meager. So Matt's team made the risky choice to self-distribute theatrically in 2010. We were lucky in that one of the financiers wanted to kind of break the paradigm. I was very resistant, by the way. I was like, I can't self-distribute this movie. Hmm. This is insanity. You know, it's, it's enough to get the movie done, right? So I was extremely resistant. There had been very little self-distribution in docs at that time or in, in anything, frankly. But it was starting to be an idea, sometimes called DIY distribution. So we got some money from uh, one of the financiers, and uh, we just started to make a go of it. And um, it's a long story. Uh, there are some really kind of crazy breaks that we had. The biggest one is that at your festival, Toronto, I, you, you were actually have a big part in this, Tom, because you said to me or one of your people said, can you stay for that last screening? And I was like, oh, my God. Like, <laughs> 
$150 change fee on my ticket. <laughs> I mean, this is just intolerable, but I'll do it, you know. So I stayed another two days or something and went to the last screening at the Scotia Bank Theater. And there, you know, it was full. They were selling out these screenings and the screening went great, whatever. And I did a Q&A. And then this man came down from the back and said, I really like this movie. Um, can you send me a print? This was like the last print ever made <laughs> of a doc. And it was Ivan Reitman. Uh -huh. And uh, he said, send me the print. I said, oh, sure, I'll send you the print. So we sent him the print. I didn't hear anything. And then um, months later, when we were ready to release the film, uh, I was at a party with Valentino in L.A. in his circle. And Oprah Winfrey walked in and made a beeline for Valentino and burst into tears and said, I loved your movie. It reminded me in my relationship with Gail. And Valentino was kind of like, I don't know what to say. And then Giancarlo came over and said, put us on your show. <laughs> and she said, I want you on the show. Come next week to Chicago. So the next thing we knew, we flew to Chicago. And she did a show on the movie. Well, this was the greatest gift an independent film could have, uh, especially one that's doing self-distribution. So we went from ze below zero to... Wow trending we trended three on twitter i think that day and that was the week a message uh, to all toronto film festival filmmakers stay for that second screening I, it was the fourth screening and i tell everyone to stay for the screenings you never know what's going to happen uh yeah ivan reitman had showed it to oprah um who's his neighbor i, I, I gather and um i ran into him in a restaurant like three years after that and i said you're responsible for everything <laughs> <laughs> You don't know what you did, but you did a great turn. Well, one thing that impressed me about you that year is that you really showed up for everything. Mm -hmm. And I can remember doing the first Q&A with you in September 2009 at Toronto. And then 10 months later, we were doing a Q&A together at the Traverse City Film Festival. <laughs> And you did not exhibit any weariness about it. You would answer questions that I'd heard you answering nine months before as if it was the first time you'd ever heard that question. I remember I grew up around old actors. So, you know, it's so, you know, like the show must go on, all that kind of old hoofer thing. I hmm. think that might have rubbed off on me. Uh, one. Two, when you're self-distributing the film, you have to show up. You have to keep it fresh because the Q&A is so key. I've been to so many Q&As where you like the film and then the filmmaker gets up and the energy is weird or they're not mm -hmm. dealing with it well or they're not comfortable in front of an audience and they kind of deflate the film and undermine it. And I never, never want that to happen. Uh, so It's yeah. true. I think that Q&A can raise or lower an audience's experience by about 30%. Yeah, it really can. So I was determined. But this is the real thing about self-distribution. We had a huge success. In theaters, the film grossed $1.7 million, according to Box Office Mojo. That's no small feat for a documentary. So... The schadenfreude was really great because a lot of the big distributors I heard through the grapevine and some even had the grace to say it to me and said, that was a huge mistake. We should never have passed on that movie. So that was schadenfreude city. Uh <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back with more from Matt Turnauer discussing his new film, Citizen Jane, Battle for the City, after the break. If you're in New York City this spring, please join us for our weekly screening series, Stranger Than Fiction, at the IFC Center. Each Tuesday, we show a documentary sneak preview or classic, followed by a conversation with a filmmaker or special guest. This season's films include Abacus, Small Enough to Jail by Steve James, The B-Side by Errol Morris, and Step by Amanda Lippitz. To find out more, go to purenonfiction.net and click on events. Matt Turnauer always had a passion for architecture and wrote about the topic in between his celebrity assignments. After Valentino, that interest led him to Jane Jacobs. One of the books you have to read, I think, if you're interested in architecture is The Death and Life of Great American Cities, which is a 
classic, never been out of print, 61 book by Jane Jacobs. And she, I kind of, I vaguely knew about her. I picked up the book a while ago and I read it and thought, oh, this is a really good book. So later on, it wasn't a book that you'd read in school. No, I found it on Bleecker Street when there used to, there used to be a couple bookstores on Bleecker Street mm-hmm. before there were all boutiques. And there was one had on a table outside. And, and Greenwich Village is her was her ground zero. That's where she lived. And she wrote about Greenwich Village as uh, a model for what cities could be. And she's talking about it in the 1950s when it was – some people thought it was a slum then. It's impossible to believe that now. But it was not a great part of town. Uh, anyway, she um, wrote this magnificent book. I read it and was blown away by the uh, the voice. And what it does is it makes you see the city in a different way. And this was right after the Valentino film came out. And I was looking for another subject. And I was uh, talking with uh, Robert Hammond, who's a friend who co-created the High Line in New York. And we were talking about how we had both recently read The Death of Life of Great American Cities and couldn't believe that we had never read it before, especially Robert, who did this kind of very community-based, activist-based project that was such a success that went in literally in Jane Jacobs' backyard. Mm. I mean, it was mm. like a great, a big landmark thing in the village. But Can you he, describe yeah. something sure. from that book that stood out to you? Her voice, she has such a peculiarly strong writing style. And as a nonfiction writer, I gravitate toward that. It's really hard to write with um, a distinct style and be clear and have a voice. Uh, And especially writing about that subject. She's writing about urban planning and architecture. And one, as a, someone who writes about architecture, my, one of my real pet peeves is architect speak, hmm. and especially writers who use it. I think this is like the greatest sin to write in impenetrable jargon. I, I come from the James Thurber elements of style hmm. school. I mean, E.B. White is actually what I meant to say, but Thurber was all a part of that. That kind of 1920s New Yorker, uh, omit unnecessary words uh, school of uh, writing where our, the our way people write about architecture is just it's it's really hideous she was uh, the antithesis of that she wrote about it in this clear style and she also um, smashed all these sacred cows and uh, uh, one thing that appealed to me, this is getting a little nerdy, but I'm a modernist. I love modernism. I'm a groupie. I love Mies van der Rohe, my favorite architect, and I'm interested in Corbusier. And this is the great story of architecture in the 20th century, which is one of the great stories of our time. And she demolishes all of these sacred cows who I love. <laughs> and I was so fascinated. And she makes a really compelling case about uh, her great phrase in the book is, a city cannot be a work of art. Mm-hmm. We interviewed Henry Cobb, who's one of the great living modernists. He's I.M. Pei's partner. He designed some of the greatest modern buildings in the world. And he, the whole interview was taken up with Henry Cobb, who's in his late 80s now, I think, in a, in a swivet that this woman could write those words, a city could not be a work of art. It was the antithesis of what a great modern architect uh-huh. could think. And I believed that before I read the book, and I absolutely get her point. So Jacobs was making her way as a writer in the 1950s at a time when there weren't a whole lot of other women doing that. Do you know what the qualities about her were that, that enabled her to do that? A tenacity, native intelligence, really brilliant, fearless. So, little context here. She's a journalist in the uh, starting in the twenties, freelancing. Women at that time, this was not woman's work, really. I mean, if it was, you wrote for the woman's pages, which is what they were called then, which was things about uh, fashion and flowers and social events and things like that. Real, real work of any sort was always done by men, of course, right? So uh, she's in this environment that's sexist. She's also fascinated with urbanism and architecture, and this is the, these are still male-dominated mm-hmm. fields. It's shocking. Uh, how urban planning and architecture are still dominated by this. And the journalistic division that covered that, very male-dominated, very sexist. So she starts to make a name doing this, and she's very outspoken. She's 
not just following the pack, but she's starting to very early in her journalistic career be somewhat skeptical and she's kind of on to things. And she's obviously very good. She gets a job at Architectural Forum, which was the place then, owned by Henry Luce. The origin of all this thinking that she did was she was put on the basically the urban renewal beat, which was after World War II, a big thing. Therein begins our story hmm. because uh, or it became called it became to be called urban renewal, and it was a great idealistic thought that people like Eleanor Roosevelt believed in, the progressives all believed in. So it seemed like a marvelous idea at the time, taking these modernist precepts that you know Corbusier had proposed, which were going to be we're going to tear out all the slums and we're going to rebuild all these modern buildings and everyone's going to live in um, cleanliness with lots of s- sunlight and no disease. And it was going to be, as Philip Johnson said, the Holy Ghost would descend and everyone would live ever happily ever after. Look great on paper. Corbusier was the greatest marketer of all time, you realize, in retrospect. His drawings were so sexy hmm. and appealing and you got it in an instant, right? It was like, this looks fabulous. This is the future. And futurism was a great thing. So Jacobs is right covering this. And she at first, and this is why I think she's an interesting character. She's actually turns out to be an apostate. She drank the Kool-Aid and was writing it and believing it. Mm. And then she says, and you'll hear in the film say, uh, eventually some of these things began to be built. (laughs) And she, uh, everyone was perfectly content. They all looked shiny and new, but this is where she's really uh, ahead of the curve. She actually goes to these places, which are not necessarily, I mean, Rockefeller Center would be the thing that people would see. It's not exactly urban renewal, but it was like this vaguely modern futuristic thing, which seemed to work great. Go up to Harlem though, where people weren't going and see what they had built, like thousands of units of housing having torn down other thousands of units of housing that had been there for almost a century and were considered slums. And others live there. African Americans live there. Italian Americans live there. Puerto Ricans live there. So journalists weren't going up there and looking. She went up and looked at what had been built. And she went to Philadelphia similarly and did that. And she began to say, wait a minute, something's very wrong here. And she began to talk to the people who lived in the projects. And they were saying, this is worse than it was before. No one would believe them, Hmm. basically. Hmm. Uh, It was like, what do you mean? This is, you have a clean place to live. What are you complaining about? There's a lawn over there. What had happened, and this is what she got, and this is difficult even today to get. Social capital, which is a term she might have coined, was removed by doing this. And what she understood is cities are networks. They're not buildings. Buildings are part of a city. The real city comes from networks of uh, individuals going about their own business, creating a tightly woven fabric of social capital, which are the little things. It's the guy at the candy store who knows your kid's name and tells him not to jaywalk. Hmm. Or um, the person who, um, you know, the handyman that says that, hey, don't play stickball here because you'll break a window. She saw that these were the things that were being uprooted and destroying cities and making them lifeless kind of tombs or uh, potentially dangerous places because her great precept that everyone remembers is they remove the eyes on the street, which was this principle of self self self-regulation and self-policing that citizens in their own neighborhoods do. The housing projects destroyed that because there were no eyes there were no eyes in the street anymore for many reasons that are architecturally complex and have to do with buildings set back from the street, et cetera, et cetera. This is the mantra of Corbusier, who was in many ways an idealist. Everyone took his ideas. They look great on paper. They were a disaster in practice. So she puts all these ideas into her book One thing that I learned from the film is some of the the criticism that the book took, including disappointing to me from Lewis Mumford in The New Yorker, because I get so much uh, pleasure out of reading Mumford. Well, Lewis Mumford, who is a giant, somewhat forgotten, he was the architecture, most famously the architecture critic for The New Yorker, but he wrote um, a series of very, very respected um, classic books about cities. He was sort of Mr. City. 
And the architecture world and the urban planning world is so clubby. It's, it's repulsive to this very day. Um, so he was sort of like the president of the Century Club of <laughs> urban planning, you know. And he actually blessed Jane early in the career, her career. She, he saw her give a speech at Harvard way early in her tenure as a journalist and said, this woman's on to something. Because Lewis Mumford hated one person more than anyone else, and that was Robert Moses, mm. who was the, called the master builder, the power broker. He was the most powerful unelected official probably in American history. And he basically controlled all of the building money in New York City. And he did a lot of great things early before the Depression, during the Depression. And after the war, he went, he turned bad in this kind of incredible um, Dr. Evil way and bought into urban planning, uh, urban renewal wholesale, and basically had racist tendencies. And, you know, this was a time of what was called white flight, and the suburbs were the thing, and other people lived in cities. This was the, the thought of the time and who cared about them. And let's put these people, we're talking about basically African-Americans, let's put them in housing projects that will get them out of the slums and get them off the streets. Well, there's a lot of insidious ideology actually behind that, which was masked as a progressive idea at mm. the time. And there were progressive sentiments behind it, which was, okay, let's get rid of slums, but Jane, what Jane Jacobs was saying is, wait, stop, think about what you're doing, and let's consider this from a different perspective, which was basically the social capital argument. Well, anyway, um, for other reasons, Lewis Mumford hated Moses, um, and Mumford and Jacobs, once she wrote her book, it turned out had huge disagreements. Hmm. Because Mumford had another theory, which was more like something called the Garden City, which was let's like let's split split it halfway. Let's have a city, but let's have greenery and less density. And the Garden City was built in the kind of mid century, early mid century. And there are a lot of cities around the country called Garden City, whatever. There's Garden City, Long Island. These are literally part of a movement of urban planning, which is we'll do like a sort of city suburb and it's going to be more healthy for people. And Jane Jacobs hated this. Hmm. She said, no, all or nothing. I'm sorry. It's all about density. And she turned out to be right, theoretically, uh, and freakishly right, because she had no science to back her up. Hmm. But now in an era when um, sustainability is the key word to everything, cities are far more sustainable than less dense places. So she won on that point, which is a huge point in a world where fossil fuels are dwindling and we have many other concerns. So she, she ends up, she keeps winning historically. Hmm. But back to our story, which is that when Lewis Mumford reviewed the book in The New Yorker, which was the high pulpit review, he trashed this book and called it in his headline, Mother Jacobs's Home Remedies. And it was a very sexist review. Uh, if you read it today, it's shocking. You would, could never write something like this today. And he basically calls her a wives' tale practitioner and says all these very clearly sexist things that probably didn't read that way to some eyes at the time, but now it's appalling. And um, they then became kind of enemies. Uh, <laughs> and it didn't, the book, the, it's funny, the book um, uh, rose. Uh, it wasn't a huge bestseller, but it became a classic. And uh, she became well that's interesting to me that d d despite uh, kind of takedown in right. the you know the main literary journal audiences still found her book yeah I mean, I mean it had a huge impact in the industry in urban planning and architecture everyone read it so all of the influencers read it and then they started fighting about it which is the best thing that can happen to any movie or book and uh, so she ended up really winning the argument. And she changed the way urbanists, city officials, a lot of intellectuals and a lot of practitioners think about cities uh, wholesale. The impact of the book was enormous immediately. And it's never been out of print. And it, a lot of people think it changed things too far, uh, that a lot of in big infrastructure projects didn't happen because people put the brakes on too hard. And she's assailed for that. 
And these, again, these are, these are arguments with you know, arguments within arguments, and they are fascinating if you're into the subject. But she had a few top line ideas that are very, very interesting and make you see the city in a different way, which is her, I think, her great contribution to the masses. You cannot see, read her book, or I hope see this movie and see the city in the same way. She makes you see it differently because she shows you that it's networks of, and you get it. Someone who saw it differently was Robert Moses, who spent decades in New York government accumulating more power than any elected official. He had a zeal for raising neighborhoods to replace them with modernist housing projects. You have to move a lot of people out of the way of a big housing project or a slum clearance project. A lot of them are not going to like it. Many of them are misinformed. Moses was a genius in almost every way. He was uh, the brightest guy in um, bureaucratic politics in New York. And he started as a progressive. He had a very long career. So he starts in the teens at the height of the progressive movement. He's from a rich kind of our crowd Jewish family from New Haven. He's a Yaley. And he gets into government and he doesn't have to really work for a living because his mother supports him with their, their, I think, dry goods fortune or something Mm. like that. So he starts taking low paying jobs and is so smart that he just demolishes everyone around him and keeps rising and rising and rising. He becomes very quickly at a young age, the chief aide to Al Smith, who was the progressive democratic government, Tribune of the People, governor of New York in the 20s. And what he did in that period is um, remarkable. He was the person who wrote the laws of the state of New York. And what he achieved, and this is where the, the darkness starts to come in, is he wrote the laws in ways that made him powerful. So he created what are called authorities, which were a new form of government agency that were kind of extra governmental, like private companies embedded within the government. And he wrote these laws so that he could be the CEO of these things. And he ended up over the years being kind of like this quasi CEO of 30 government agencies or authorities, which gave him power and he was unfireable. Because he'd written the laws. He'd written the laws, and he was so smart that he knew how to write a law. Who knows how to write a law? I mean, (laughs) he knew. He was that brilliant, and he had a mind for details, and uh, he was very thorough. And he started doing things that were nominally for the public good. Jones Beach is probably the greatest example of that. No one could go to the beach unless you were rich in the 20s. It was a fact. The roads weren't good. You couldn't get there. People wanted to go to the beach. It was a great idea. He built the biggest public beach ever in the world, and it's still there, and it still works. Hmm. Um, But there were lots of flaws in in what he did uh, even before the war, and then after the war, things got progressively more haywire, and he became power mad. So absolute power corrupts absolutely is the adage for Moses. A major project for Moses was building the Cross Bronx Expressway that displaced thousands of people from their homes. Look, he had a very top-down view of things. And what one thing the movie makes you see is top-down versus bottom-up. And uh, these are two ways of looking at the world. And it actually, these are kind of magic words, like form and content top down and bottom up, you can then apply them across a huge spectrum of things in our lives that affect us. It's happening right now with crazy autocratic, kleptocratic government or take it to the streets, change the conversation, change the laws. We're seeing it today in a way that we haven't seen it in quite some time. That's top down, bottom up. Robert Moses was Mr. Top Down of his era. And you know what? Mid-century, World War II era, that was very top-down. You had to be top-down. We were doing something that was we'd never really had to do before, which was preventing a dark age from descending upon the planet, which, by the way, we might be doing again today, which we can talk about in a second. But uh, top-down in that instance was probably okay because it was an extraordinary time. So a generation of people that were top-down thinkers 
were in charge. And he was a, a natural top-down thinker, very effective at making these big moves. The Cross Bronx Expressway seemed to someone like him like a good idea. How were you going to get trucks from New Jersey up to New England to get food or tires or whatever supplies up there? You needed that. The Bronx was in the way. The Bronx was a thriving middle class area at that time, but it was a relatively kind of like, it was kind of not that old at the time. It was sort of like hitting its stride, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't the fancy part of the city. And you know what? We could kind of take care of these people and move them somewhere else, which was exactly the way he thought. It wasn't glamorous. And Jews and Italians and some African Americans at the time lived there, and they were not really of great concern to people who were generally the people in charge. So what does he do? He plows a highway diagonally through the densest, you know, like the second densest part of New York City, displaces thousands upon thousands of people and wrecks an entire borough, basically. It made total sense to him. He didn't think twice about it. And it made total sense to the concrete companies and the um, bricklayers and all of the unions who saw it as a, a job creator. And it made most of all sense to General Motors and Ford Motor Company who loved the idea of having places where their products could run. And he was very much in collusion with the car companies because you remember at this time we think, well, the car, you know, like there were always highways there. There certainly were not. Like there were not modern highways and he built many of them and now we see the way they were built plowing through inner cities, which again were thought to be ghettos and filled with worthless people whose lives didn't count. This was a huge error in American history and Moses was a huge proponent of it and Jacobs was one of the people saying, stop this now and figuring out how we're going to stop it. So I don't want to recap your whole film, but I do want to kind of set the stage for what the main battle of the film is which is that after the Cross Bronx Expressway, Moses has an idea to plow a highway through lower Manhattan. It had been his dream. (laughs) He actually wanted to build three highways plowing through Manhattan, and he was always trying to do it. He never gave up. And he would kind of like put one on hold and then work on another one, et cetera, depending on who the governor was. So the lower Manhattan Expressway, which was supposed to connect the Holland Tunnel with the Williamsburg and Manhattan Bridges, which was, again, New Jersey is so important in all this. It was all about getting cars from New Jersey to Long Island so they wouldn't have to um, stop or be in traffic in, you know, dumb old Manhattan. But this was the... This was the suburban period, you know. This is like, yeah, let's get all, let's do stuff for the suburban people. Well, who are the suburban people? They're the white people. You know, this was really huge racist implications, race implications in all of these activities hidden. So the plan was connect the tunnels to the bridges. And he was also busy building up Long Island as a suburb. You know, Long Island had been this kind of like wilderness paradise and beach paradise and farm country. He wanted to make it a suburb, which he did. And so this lower Manhattan highway would have plowed through Little Italy, Soho, Greenwich Village. These are neighborhoods that even if you've never been to New York City, you know them as mythical places. Yeah. They're the places no one cared about then, but now seem like the marquee places of the city. So it's more than even what you said, the West Village, partly. What became Soho was then called various things like Hell's Hundred Acres because it was a this thought to be worthless post-industrial wasteland that actually ended up being the most important collection of 19th century cast iron buildings uh, in the world which was at the time thought to be a useless remnant of the industrial age, Chinatown. Now all the, these are the places people love to talk about and hang out in, right? So uh, the context has totally changed, circumstances have totally changed. At the time, these were considered depressed parts of the city that were, needed to be torn down. And Moses had a totally complete plan to obliterate everything that is still there and replace it with uh, housing projects, basically, and highways. 
we showed this film as the opening night of the Doc NYC Festival on November 10th, two days after the U.S. election of Donald Trump. It felt very significant then to be watching a story about citizens-led movement against a megalomaniac New York developer. And I wonder, in the recent months, as you've you know come to think about the film more and come to think about where we're at as a country more, you know, what you think Jane Jacobs' story has to say to us today. Yeah, well, we thought we were making a movie that would debut in a first woman president context, and we ended up making a movie that premiered in a um, like surprise election with unprecedented circumstance, which is this unqualified, kleptocratic, autocratic uh, celebrity as president of the United States who has kind of authoritarian tendencies. Very Moses-like, uh, although I think Moses was a great intellect. Uh, I don't think Trump qualifies as that. So Jacobs leads a citizen's movement against someone who was thought to be uh, impervious to anything. The most powerful people, the pre presidents of the United States couldn't touch Moses. And Jacobs is the leader of a bottom-up resistance movement which is taking it to the streets with tactics, defending uh, minority communities, basically, and uh, vulnerable parts of cities and vulnerable populations. And you know what? She's effective. Uh, she really put chinks in Moses's armor. He was losing power anyway, but it was kind of like they were putting the final spears into the dragon. And she, through her tactics and her strategies, is, I think, a huge inspiration for our time, it turns out. And the movie is very much plays that way. Uh, we always knew that. We always made a movie about that. But now the resonance, I think, is even greater because a lot of people are wondering, what, well, what can I do? This seems to be absolutely intractable until something gives. Well, Jacobs, if she were here, I think I, I always hesitate to put words in her mouth because she was a unique thinker. But I think she would say, "I like take it to the streets, think, strategize." And she shows you you see in the movie how she did it in her particular circumstances. And she was relentless and fearless and um, made a difference. So I think uh, what happened soon after the election, the eve of the inauguration, or right after the inaugurations, was the Women's March. Well, I think this is a very Jane Jacobs event. And you know what? Uh, we're seeing tangible results, which I don't think we felt we could see for a long time uh, until now. Um, it's, there's a great necessity, and I think she's uh, an icon for our time. I want to thank Matt Turnauer for speaking with me. His film, Citizen Jane, Battle for the City, opens in theaters on April 21st. Pure Nonfiction is distributed by the TIFF Podcast Network. This interview was recorded at the School of Visual Arts, where I teach at the MFA Social Documentary Program. Thanks to our team, series producer, Michael Scotty Jr., sound mixer, Kyle Murphy, web designer, Cross Strategy, Marketing Coordinator, Sarah Modo, Social Media Master, Jordan Smith, and Executive Producer, Rafaela Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. You can follow me on Twitter at T-H-O-M Powers. If you're in New York, check out our screening series, Stranger Than Fiction, on Tuesday nights at IFC Center. You can read our show notes, learn about live events, and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net. <laughs>